All right, so I want to start today, actually, uh, by telling you a story from my teenage years. You guys ready for this? I don't, Elliot is great at telling stories. I don't always tell them. Uh, I'm going to tell you a story from my teenage years about the one and only time where I was uh, picked up by the police. I know. And I was paraded by everyone through, you know, by, by everyone during lunchtime at my high school. I went to Lodi High School. Uh, and it was the most probably embarrassing day of my life. And uh, that's, that's the story I want to tell you about today. So I was a sophomore in high school. And you guys, I mean, moms, parents in the rooms, like sleepovers on a school night are not a thing, right? Like generally, we don't do that, okay? Uh, but as a kid, you're like, why not? You know, like we're going to see each other at school anyway, and we're hanging out after school. We might as well just like have a sleepover and then do it together. My mom was always anti-school night sleepovers. Power to you. Keep that tradition alive. But for some reason, and I can't remember the reason, I don't know if I was at my friend's house and my mom needed help or they were doing something and so I was staying there late, so it just made sense to stay over. Uh, but this is a friend who I hung out with sometimes, but they weren't like a bestie. They were just, you know, anyway. So, so my mom agreed to let me stay the night at this person's house, but the condition was I 100% absolutely had to be at school the next day. You know, like no ditching, no being late, no being tired, no having a bad attitude. Like you got to get to school and you got to be there. And I am a good kid. I was a good kid. I loved, I'm a rule follower to this day. I love following the rules. Um, and I didn't want to like disappoint anybody, let anybody down. So we have this sleepover at my friend's house. We may have dyed my hair. I don't know. We were there, <clears throat> and then the next morning, we can't drive yet. We're sophomores, so we're not 16. We get in her mom's car. Her mom takes us to school, and we make it. Uh, so I remember kind of being a little bit nervous, like my mom's going to kill me if I don't make it there on time, you know? She's going to kill me if I don't get to school. So I was a little bit nervous that something was going to happen. Maybe she was going to be late, or my friend was going to pretend to be sick and not go to school, and then I couldn't get a ride. But we make it to school which is fantastic. And then we're walking through, but she drops us off at the front. If you're familiar with Lodi High, there's the front of the school, there's the back of the school. I always got dropped off at the back of the school where I'd have to walk through the entire like blacktop and portables and then I'd go into my class and nobody's there. Like nobody gets dropped off back there. So it's, and I have my brother with me. It's me and my brother all the time or me and my other friend. So I get dropped off at the front of the school with this friend, which is completely out of context for me. Everybody's at the front of the school. Like everybody is there. And I'm the kind of kid who the night before, I would make sure I had my books for first, second, and third period in my backpack so I didn't have to visit the locker until later in the day, okay? So I don't need to go through the locker area. I don't need to be where all the people are. I just get there. I get to school. I wake up 10 minutes before I'm supposed to be there, you know, maybe go to school with wet hair. I don't care. I'm just getting to class. Not this day, though. This day, I'm at the front of the school with my friends. We're in the hallway where all the lockers are. And I'm thinking, like, we made it. It's good. But we run into some friends. And this friend I'm hanging out with, she's a little bit more cool than I am. Okay, I was kind of a nerd, kind of a loner. I would sit alone at lunchtime, and I just didn't care. You know, like, just eat some lunch. It's fine. But this friend, she was a little bit more popular. The, the popular kids were intimidating to me. I'm like, you don't even know my name. Uh, and so she run, we run into some of her friends. They're friends that I knew, but I wouldn't call them friends. They're more like acquaintances. It's like, oh, you know my name? Cool. Uh, we run into them, and they were like, hey, uh, we're going to go off campus today. We haven't even made it to class yet. You know, we're just walking down the hallway. We're going to go off campus today. And uh, so they, they want to go to the mall. Like, it's, you know what time school starts? It starts like 7.15 in the morning. The mall isn't open for like three more hours. This is what they decided they want to do. They want to go to the mall. And in my brain, I'm going, this is a terrible idea. Just go to class. You made it to school. You had the sleepover. It's been a success. Just get to class. But I was nervous. I'm out of my element. I'm out of my routine. I'm not with my people. And I'm like, I can't be the nerdy one who just is like, bye. So I like, all right, we're doing this. Let's go. So the four of this, me, three other girls, whatever. And then we all can't drive. So there's a boyfriend, you know, some older boyfriend, like a senior is the one who's driving us into Stockton because the mall's not in Lodi. The mall's in Stockton. Drives us into Stockton. We get there, and then they realize the mall's not open, okay? So we end up at the breakfast place. We go somewhere. We have breakfast. Guys, a real sit-down place for breakfast. You know how much allowance money I had? I had $10 a week, which is $2 a day. You're not getting anything at a sit-down restaurant for $2. So I'm sitting there. I'm starving. They're eating. I'm like... 
what am I doing? You know, like, I hope my mom doesn't find out. But my, Jesus loves my mom, okay? And my mom knows all things because Jesus tells her in the secret quiet place in her dreams. He tells her what's happening in my life and my other's life. It was like, uh, she's crazy, die hard. Jesus loves her. Okay, so I already know, like, I'm busted. Nothing's happened, but my mom knows. Okay, so we, we, we make it through breakfast, and I finally start to relax. I'm a little bit high strung, if you've never met me before. A little bit high strung. I'm starting to relax a little, going, okay, we made it. Like, so we're, we're getting, now we're to the point where it's time. So we get to the mall parking lot, we get dropped off, and I'm thinking, okay, great, we made it to the mall. What could go wrong? We're on our way up to the doors, and this police car drives by. It's like the truancy police. You know, they drive by real slow, and they spot us, the four, these four girls. Okay, and I don't look my age now, so I definitely didn't look my age then. I look little. And I'm wearing a sweatshirt that says Lodi High. There's no doubt about the fact that I am a young high school student okay so we're walking up she catches us and she starts she doesn't accuse us she just starts asking us questions and I'm not saying a word because I don't never I don't know what to do in this situation and so my friend starts spewing off lie after lie after lie after lie saying that we got expelled we're expelled and so we don't have to be in school today and they're like well then where's your pink card and I'm like what the heck a pink card, you know? Apparently, if you get expelled, you have a card, and you're also supposed to be at home. So they're like, no, we're not. And the reason we got expelled is because we got into a fight. And I'm like, have you seen me? I haven't fought anybody. Ah. So we got into a fight, got expelled. That She doesn't buy it. So then they start telling some other made-up story. Anyway, we have to get in the back of the police car. So we get in the back of the police car, and she takes us to, like, the detention center where we have to sit. And she has to call her mom moms one at a time my mom can't hear okay another fun fact about my mom is she's hard of hearing she's deaf so she uh, reads lips and she does sign language and she can communicate but in order to call my mom you have to call through the relay system and I hate the relays I hate it because you, you say something and then you have to say go ahead because you have to tell the operator like that's the end of your sentence and so I'm with my friends that aren't really my friends I don't know them very well and I'm the one who has to talk to my mom because they don't know how to use a relay system and I've got to tell my mom what happened it's mortifying okay so that happens <clears throat> We have killed most of the school day by this point, though. Okay, so by this, so the truancy officer, we don't have a car, we don't have a ride. They put us in the back of the police car and they drive us all the way back into Lodi, to Lodi High, and it's lunchtime. Lunchtime. And so they drop us off in the front and they don't just leave us there, they escort us to the principal's office. And so we're walking through and everybody's outside at lunchtime, you know? So part of me is like, really, really embarrassed that this is happening, and I beat red, and I hate it. And the other part of me is going like, I'm kind of cool right now, you know? <laughs> like that weird, what is this? And then so we go to the principal's office. They give I've never been to the principal's office in my life ever. We get Saturday school. Also never done that. There's a whole other story with Saturday school. We do Saturday school. Uh, and then I go, by the time I, there's only six periods. By the time I get to school, it's fifth period. Okay, lunch is over. And so I walk into fifth period. And I remember that was my driver's ed class. It was like driver's ed slash something else. You know, and everybody's like, and most of the people that I'm in classes with, I'm in classes with all day. And so they're like, where have you been all day? You know? And I'm like, again, super embarrassed about what happened, but also like a little bit, I feel cool. It's a weird, weird thing that happens. Anyway, end of the day, I get home and my mom and her mom, the girl I had a sleepover with that night, they're both in my living room. And I'm like, <laughs> my mom's going to kill me. So I walk in, my mom keeps her cool. Brittany, her name's Brittany. She gets in trouble. They go away. And then uh, the, I get grounded for two months. My mom talks to me, and then two months, I get grounded. Everybody else thought it was harsh. And I was like, no, nah, it's fair. <laughs> it's fair. I did some things. Uh, <clears throat> anyway, so through that whole thing, uh, moral of the story, sleepovers on a school night are not the best idea. You already know that. I just confirmed it for you. Even if your kid makes it to school, there's a whole plethora of other things that can go wrong on the spot when you get there. Uh, but so I, I was, you know, out of routine. I wasn't set up for success. And I should have just believed my mom. You know, sleepovers on a school night are bad. doesn't matter. Uh, so I want to just, you know, why did, why did I tell you that story? Because it doesn't seem to amount to anything. And really, it depends on who you are in the room. Because you can either relate 
to my story because there's something in it that was familiar or a spot in your life where um, maybe if it's not familiar, there was maybe a spot in your life that opened up to me in a way that wasn't open to me before because you, you know a little bit more about me than you had in the past. Uh, studies show that good stories do more than create a sense of connection. They actually build familiarity and trust. And they allow the listener to enter the story where they are making room um, and making people more open to learning. And in fact, if you go back to the scriptures, it is very much like our Lord and Savior to tell stories in order to connect with the people that he was around. Like the story of the prodigal son uh, that went away and came home. And we see the perspective of the father, the son, and the older brother. Or there's the beggar and the rich man who sat outside uh, every day begging. It's a story he tells. And then there's going to be death. And, and all this stuff, there's a story. So we have a whole series <clears throat> actually coming up at the end of the month. So on May 26th, uh, we have a whole series that's going to launch, and it's all about storytelling. It's called At the Movies. It's coming May 26th. That series is going to run for four months. So from Memorial Day weekend all the way through Father's Day weekend for... <laughs> did I say four months? You're like, oh my gosh. <sighs> It's going to run for four weeks from Memorial Day weekend through Father's Day weekend. And what it is, is we're going to use movies, which are modern day parables that can be used to teach a biblical principle. So if you've never been here for that series, I encourage you to be here. If you've been here before, a lot of people, this is their favorite series. So they come out, we have snacks, we have soda, we turn it like into the movie theater. And it's, it's really fun series. It's a great way to engage people who maybe aren't familiar with church, who haven't had a church experience in a long time. So that's coming up. But the title of today's message is called Storytelling. So we're still in our series, Home is Where the Heart Is, and we're continuing the conversation that Pastor Elliot started last week as it relates to parenting and what we can learn from Scripture. And so my goal today really is to resource us, to resource you guys. Um, and one of the biggest resources that we have at our disposal um, from Scripture are the amount of stories that Jesus used and that are in the Old Testament about how we get closer to him. He used stories all the time. And studies show, again, storytelling helps with learning because stories are easy to remember. Cold hard facts like in and out, but stories, they create empathy, they create compassion. You can relate to them, and so they're easier to remember. Uh, and the studies go as far as to state that if you are trying to engage, influence, teach, or inspire others, you should be telling stories. Uh, and so if you're a parent, I know for a fact that you're trying to engage, influence, teach, and inspire your children through their different stages of life. Elliot talked last week about the stages of life. Um, so there's something for us today. But even if you're not a parent, uh, there's something here for everyone today. Because even in your workplace or in your family structures and with the people in your circles, there are moments where you're trying to teach, you're trying to influence, you're trying to engage, and stories are one of the best ways that we do that. They're one of the best ways that we disciple the people around us. And so we're going to go Old Testament today. <laughs> That's where we're going to be. Uh, but if you said yes to a bulletin on your way in, the sermon notes are in there so you can get those out and follow along. And if you have the YouVersion Bible app, you can find Lifeline Church, you can find the event titled Storytelling, you can pull that up and you can follow along there as well. So we're going to be in Deuteronomy chapter 11. <clears throat> and in this section of Deuteronomy, the Israelites are still in the wilderness. They haven't entered the promised land, but they've been given the Ten Commandments. They've seen some things. They've been given the laws and all that kind of stuff. Um, and they've, what, what, what has happened is they have seen some things. They've been through some things. They have made some mistakes, but they have also birthed a whole new generation of young people. And what we see is God is teaching them how to teach their kids. And so that's what I want to look at. We're opening and God is teaching through Moses this generation of people how to teach the generation of people that, that they just brought up. So we open with Moses and he's speaking to the adults. Deuteronomy chapter 11, start in verse 1. He says, you must love the Lord your God and always obey his requirements, decrees, regulations, and commands. He says, keep in mind, I'm not talking now to your children who have never experienced the discipline of the Lord your God or seen his greatness and his strong hand and powerful arm. They didn't see the miraculous signs and wonders he performed in Egypt against Pharaoh and all his land. 
They didn't see what the Lord did to the armies of Egypt and to their horses and chariots, how he drowned them in the Red Sea as they were chasing you. He destroyed them and they have not recovered to this very day. So I just want to pause. The Lord through Moses is telling the adults to know their personal and group history. Why? Because he, God, the Lord, the Lord, our God, the, the almighty God, he's not interested in rescuing just one generation. He was after generations of people and he still is after generations of people. And so here's a difficult truth. You cannot expect of your children what you do not know yourself. So he's not talking to their children. He's talking to the adults and he's reminding them about that. So the first for us, the first course of action for us as we parent and as we lean in is to know our own story and what the Lord has done for us. Know your own story and what the Lord has done for you. So moving backwards, a way that you can apply that right now is moving backwards from whatever age you are at today. Do you know what God has done for you and can you articulate it? Do you know what God has done for you? And can you articulate it? Because it's a powerful tool in resourcing the next generation to love and serve God. Your testimony of his faithfulness and how he has brought you through some things. So we're going to keep going. He says, your children didn't see how the Lord cared for you in the wilderness until you arrived here. They did not see what he did. I love this story. They did not see what he did to Dathan and Abiram, the sons of Eliab, a descendant of Reuben, when the earth opened up up its mouth and the Israelite camp swallowed them along with their households um, and everything that belonged to them. He says, but you have seen the Lord perform all these mighty deeds with your own eyes. So again, I'm going to pause through Moses. God says to them, your children have not seen these things. They have not seen me at work in their life yet, but you have. And because you have seen me at work, you are inclined to hear me and you are inclined to listen to me. And that matters your story, why you are inclined to follow Jesus, why you are inclined to listen to him matters. And it's powerful. He says, you are inclined to believe that I love you and I will fight for you because of what you have seen. You are inclined to follow me. What you have seen has caused you to believe. And so Moses, through the, through the Lord, through Moses, is reminding them to share those stories and to share your history with your kids and with your people. He says, share these stories because these are what have caused you to live the way you are living. Everything in this moment is what the decisions you make today and tomorrow are informed by what the Lord has done in your past. There's a story that if you would uncover it and you would begin to share it, it will speak volumes to the next generation of people. He says, you, you, you want to live in accordance to my word to you. He says, you serve me and you follow me with conviction and with, with heart and with purpose. And so he says, let your people, your kids see me through your stories. Let your kids see me through your stories so they can choose me with conviction and heart and purpose. So for example, for the, for the, the Israelites, where were you when the sea parted? What were you feeling and what were you thinking? Were you terrified? Were you afraid? Were you confused? And then what happened? What did you see? Did you understand it? Was it awesome? Was it powerful? Was it still confusing, but also like, what? What were your thoughts and your feelings after that happened? After you're trying to put all the pieces together, what happened? How did, what did you think? How are you feeling? And then what choices did you make after that experience? And so for us, it wasn't the Red Sea parting or, you know, Jericho opening up. Uh, but, but there were moments where God showed up. There are things that have happened where God has showed up for you. He has broken down walls. He has set you free from some things. And it's a part of your story. You have had to put the pieces together. You have made some decisions and it's with heart and purpose and conviction that you follow Jesus, or you're at least leaning in to follow Jesus because of a series of things that are happening. Let your kids see that. Let them see this story because there's conviction and heart and purpose. And it's easier to follow the story than it is to follow the cold, hard facts. And then he keeps going. He, this, so this is where Moses now talks about the blessings of obedience, but he's first and foremost talking to a generation of parents. 
He says, therefore, be careful to obey every command I'm giving you today. So you may have strength to go in and take over the land you are about to enter. We're not entering the the promised land of Israel, but we're still entering into all of the promises that are yes and amen in Christ Jesus. And there's promise for us if in obedience, we walk that out. He says, if you obey, you will enjoy a long life in the land the Lord swore to give to your ancestors and to you, their descendants, a land flowing with milk and honey. And, he, and, and we'll pick it up in verse 18. He says, so commit yourselves wholeheartedly to these words of mine. Again, he's talking to the adults. He's talking to the parents. Commit yourselves wholeheartedly to these words of mine. Tie them to your hands and wear them on your forehead as reminders. Teach them to your children. Talk about them when you are at home and when you're on the road. So on your vacation and in the everyday mundane of crazy sports and life. When you're going to bed and when you are getting up at the beginning of the day and at the end of the day, remind yourself who you are, who you serve, and why you do what you do. Write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. In your coming and your going, you remember who you are and what you believe so that as long as the sky remains above the earth, you and your children may flourish in the land the Lord, the Lord swore to give your ancestors. And so to sum up that whole last section, the flourishing of your children depends on your wholehearted yes to Jesus. <laughs> it's such a good word. It's so, we want so much for our kids, but it first and foremost comes through what we have seen and heard and believed and are giving our lives to. And in Jesus, all the promises of God are yes and amen. In Jesus, we find the fulfillment of every promise. It is a good word. And so you know the stories of your life. Tell the stories. Find out the stories. Think through the stories. What were the impactful moments of your life? And I don't just mean Bible stories. Yes, absolutely. Pass on a love of the scripture to your children and the people who are trying to disciple or impact or teach, seeking to influence, because the scriptures do lead to Jesus, the author of life, who makes the word alive and living and active. But know your own stories as well in relation to the scripture. Know your own history and the moments that caused life change for you and pass those along as well. Talk about your interaction with scripture. If you're going to share a scripture verse, you know, let's not be Bible thumpers who are just beating scripture into our kids, but let's tell the story of why that scripture matters. Let me tell you this scripture. It's one of my favorites. And this is why, because it's done this for me, or it makes me think this way, or when I'm afraid or when I'm nervous and I'm not sure if God's going to be there for me. I go to the scripture and this is what it does for me. Use stories to pass on. Uh, your history and and what it is that God wants to do. My kids, uh, (laughs) they love stories. They absolutely love them. They, whenever they see, we see a lot of our grandparents all the time, their grandparents all the time. Whenever they see their grandma, which is my mom, or their yaya, which is Elliot's mom, grandpa, Grammy, grampy, uh, they love to ask, our, my, our, our gener, you know, blah, their grandparents, they love to ask their grandparents stories. They want to know stories about when they were kids, when their, their, when their grandparents were kids. And they also want to hear stories about when their mom and dad were kids. They love it. They're like, tell us embarrassing stories about when mom was a kid, or tell us embarrassing stories about when dad was a kid. And then they'll be like, Do you have any, like, we want to laugh. Tell us a funny story about when, you know, so way back in the 20s. I'm just kidding. It was more like the 60s and 70s is when my mom was a kid. Um, Okay. But they, they laugh and they ask questions. They do. They laugh and they ask questions like, how did you feel or what, what else happened? Like Yaya will tell stories about when she was embarrassed and Emma will lean in and go like, well, what did you do about that? Did you cry? She is learning. And more than she's learning, she's relating. And they want to hear the same stories again and again. They've already heard it. And they'll ask and I'm like, I can't even tell it the same way. It's not funny the second time, but they do like say it exactly the same way. Make me laugh exactly as hard as you did last Last time they live for it. Uh, But what does that do? Stories make us a relatable authority figure, which leaves room for trust to grow. Studies, um, stories create empathy, allowing others to see into the past and to feel compassion and have understanding in ways that are harder to get to 
through just cold, hard information or bossing or instruction. And so one of the, the greatest ways to teach those difficult things is to use a story to bring them into your story, to give them compassion and understanding, to let them make the connections and then do life together. Stories are one of the best ways we learn how to do life together. We're a people on mission together, our families included. When my kids grow up, I hope to God they're not on their own. I mean, I want them to be on their own, but we're, those are my people. I love my people, you know, and I want people to do life with. And so it's stories. Stories do that. I'm an adult. And I love stories. Whenever I'm listening to a communicator, I'm hoping for stories. Because if I can relate with them, I'm more apt to listen to them and to lean into what it is that they're saying and trying to communicate to me. I want to know a part of their story. I want one piece of information, especially when a communicator comes up and they've got all kinds of accolades. The first thing I want to do is turn off like, oh, you're just in my in my arrogance, I project arrogance on them. They're arrogant. They know everything. There's no way from, but when they tell a story, I'm like, oh, yes. You know, and then I lean in. I'm like, okay, I was being real judgy. You know, I see my own shortcomings and I'm able to lean into their story. So there's only two blanks. If you haven't figured it out yet, that first set of blanks is tell the stories. Tell the stories. Know what they are. Tell them. Use them. They're a great resource. And then the next thing is, what do you do when you've done all the right things? You're doing all the right things, but it still seems like you're losing them. Still seems maybe like you're losing your kids, even if you've done all the stuff. That second blank is pray. And I put it in all caps, pray. (laughs) And I mean for real. So I'm going to walk us through some scriptures. Psalm chapter 90, verses 1 writes, Satisfy us in the morning with your unfailing love, that we may sing for joy and be glad all our days. So I just want to peel back the layers. In the middle of those very difficult seasons of life, where you cannot see the light, or you cannot see how this is going to end without a miracle of God, the truth is we need some unfailing love. You need some unfailing love. You need some joy, and you need some gladness. And so in the scripture, when you read it, you remember, you, you tell yourself to remember what it is to be satisfied by the Lord because you know your story. And then ask him each morning for your heart and your mind to find rest and unfailing love. God, today, before I face the day, I know this is still difficult, but I need your rest and I need your unfailing love. Would you remind me what it is to be satisfied? May I find satisfaction with you before I go out and face the things. And we keep going in that scripture. Make us glad for as many days as you have afflicted us, for as many years as we have seen trouble. And so we start out, would you remind me of your goodness and your unfailing love? And then you ask, Lord, for as many days as this has been difficult, I ask that there would be gladness in its place. You begin to ask because he is good. He is faithful. He is a loving father and he wants this more than you want it. And if you will ask and believe and partner, he will do it for as many days as this has been difficult. I ask that there would be gladness in its place. And then verse 16, may your deeds be shown to your servants, your splendor to their children. And so you remind yourself, I know what it is to see your deeds, and I know there are more. And so I ask for them, Father. And you remind yourself and him, I am your servant. Let me see your good deeds and let my kids see your splendor. Let them see you as they have not seen you before. So you use scripture to remind yourself who you are, who your God is, and to pray those things into existence on behalf. You pray into the future what has not happened yet. There's another one, Isaiah chapter 49. We're going to pick it up in the second part of verse 23 through 25. He says, he's talking to the nation of Israel when they're coming back. And he says, you will know that I am the Lord. Those who hope in me will not be disappointed. Can plunder be taken from warriors or captives be rescued from the fierce? Because that's what they're worried about. But this is what the Lord says. Yes, captives will be taken from warriors and plunder retrieved from the fierce. I will contend with those who contend with you and your children I will save. And so using that scripture, you ask yourself, what enemies of your children's soul do you need almighty God, Jehovah, the eternal one, the one true God to contend with? 
another way to say that scripture, the Lord says, I, the eternal one will cause them to escape and be saved. What do they need to escape from and how do they need to be saved? What fierce, another way to phrase that question, what fierce warriors are vying for your kids' attention and the affections of their heart that are causing them to wander, that are causing them to go through more difficult seasons than they need to. I want to teach you how to pray something. So when we look at scripture, one of the best ways to pray scripture is to, first of all, to read it and to find the promise. Where's the promise in that scripture? In Psalm, it was uh, in the Psalms, it was make us glad for as many days as you have afflicted us. Would you show your splendor to their children? There's a promise in that. And so we found the promise and then you pray it. Isaiah, the promise was, I will contend with those who contend with you and your children I will save. So you look for the promise, but then you have to find the condition. A lot of times the promises are conditional. What is the condition of the promise? And that's what you begin to pray for. You, you declare the promise, Lord, this is, you said this. This is the promise that you said. And you said the condition was this. And so now that you found the promise and the condition, what you do is, what is going to make the condition possible? What do I need to pray that's going to make them meet the conditions? And then you begin to bring in other scriptures and promises. Uh, Lord, you, you satisfy us all the days of our life. Your word says, so if your kids already know the Lord, they've given their life to Jesus and they're kind of just wandering. You say that you will not lose one who belongs to you. And so I know they belong to you. I know they've given their life to you. And so I ask you, Father, that you would not lose them, but you would instead. And your word also says uh, that you will remind us of the things that you have spoken. They have heard some things that you have spoken. And so I ask that you would remind them of the things that you have said, and you would bring them back. You would save them because you said you would. And so you find the promise, you find the condition, and then you pray that those conditions will be met. That's how you begin to use scripture and the the armor of God. When it says in Ephesians chapter six, you put on the whole armor of God. The one weapon we have is the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. And so when you want to tear some things down, you get into that prayer closet. I don't care where your prayer closet is and you learn how to pray. So if you're telling the stories, know the stories, you have to learn to pray and pray some things. I am where I am today because I had my mom knew how to pray. She hit the floor all the time. Okay. Like I found her, you know, face down on the ground. What are you doing? You know, and then I just left her alone because I don't want none of that. I don't know what's going on. I'm not getting involved. And it was praying. She was on the floor. She was on her face and she was crying out to the Lord, her God. And my gosh, he answered all the time. Like I said, we couldn't get away with anything. Like Jesus was Johnny on the spot. Hey, I also had, I also had, um, friends, my, one of my friends, uh, Rachel, I love her to pieces. Her grandparents prayed that she would have good friends. So I'm the result of another mom's prayers, another grandparents prayers. Okay. Because she wanted, she wanted her granddaughter to have some good friends around her. And so those grandparents prayed every single day for every single one of her friends that we would grow up together. So when you, you're sending your kids out into the world and they're at school and they're at sports and you're like, just pay good friends, pray it into existence. You can put a hedge of protection around them. They will see things, but have wisdom from almighty God to know the difference and make the right choices, but you do it in prayer. It's not happenstance. It's not accidental. It's on purpose. And God is good. He will rescue. He's a fierce, strong warrior. He will do it. But I wanted to walk us through that prayer. So pray this on their behalf. My hope when we're using those two scriptures, my hope is in you, God. And your word says that those who hope in you will not be disappointed. And so I will not be disappointed by you. That's a promise. And then you say, you say, that captives will be taken from the fierce and plunder retrieved and that my children you will save and they need your saving. They need your rescuing. They are being enticed by, and then name it. Is it sexual desires outside of the right time? Is it identity confusion? Is it escaping pain through a drug or alcohol? Is it anxiety that's crushing them because of fear about the future or fear about college? And then you say, these things do not satisfy. And this is not your plan for them. They are being held captive by those external forces. And I command their release because you have authority in Jesus name to command their release as a parent, as an overseer, a shepherd of their souls. Jesus, would you send your army to war on their behalf? And 
would you bring them back into the right state of mind? Would you rescue them? And you may have to do that every day. You may have to get on the carpet next to your bed, hidden from everybody else, and just pray those things. And nobody else knows the, the depths of your soul, what you are crying out for, but you do it. It doesn't matter what anybody else is doing. It doesn't matter what anybody else is thinking. You are going to war for your children. And he is faithful. He is good. He will do it. Woo! <laughs> okay, that may have been a little bit heavy. So, that is good. Uh, I want to probably lighten the room a little bit just by but giving us some other scriptures and very practical resources that you can interact with. So, there's some books that are going to go, ah, going to go up on the screen. And these books have all been very helpful for us. The Dream Team, so many Dream Team members have read these books. And they also come highly recommended. This is what I love. They come highly recommended by pastors and leaders who have children who are adults and who are loving and serving Jesus and who have kids who are loving and serving Jesus. So there's a legacy and an impartation that these people are offering us. So the first one is Raising Passionate Jesus Followers. Um, when Pastor Elliot was talking last week, a lot of those ages and stages were a resource from this book. And what's cool about this one is you don't have to read the whole thing. You find the section that your kids are in and you read that section and you begin to build on it. And at the end of the book, it talks about retrofitting. So you came to Christ as an adult. Your kids are already like somewhere in the middle and it's crazy town. It talks about how to retrofit some of those things uh, as you move into the future. Scream Free Parenting. I don't believe that one's biblical, uh, but it's, uh, but it, it, there wasn't anything weird or crazy. And it talks about, uh, let your yes be yes and your no be no. So you as a parent, how you set those, say, my, my mom used to say this all the time. I mean what I say and I say what I mean. I mean what I say and I say what I mean. So if you were, if she said something and you asked her the second time, grounded. Like, I already told you, you knew the consequence, deal with it. But I had to learn how to do that as a parent. And so it's a great resource to help you learn how to say what you mean and mean what you say so that your parents can live, your kids can live in a safe environment, knowing like I can trust my mom, I can trust my dad. Uh, it is good. So that's a great resource. And then boundaries. If you've never set boundaries in your own life, you don't know where you end and someone else begins. That's that's a great book, a great resource I recommend, especially for moms. We take on like all the burdens of the world where mother hen's like, I'm going to solve all the problems, you know, and then you kind of crush yourself and you get angry or confused or disoriented. And so that's a great book. And then of course, the Bible, the Bible is full of stories and scriptures and, and things that are going to arm us and resource us. And then I just want to close with two very impactful scriptures that you can commit to memory. First of all, you can commit these to memory because they're going to arm you. They're going to encourage you. They're going to strengthen you. But as a family unit and with your people, you can learn to, to know these scriptures and to live these scriptures. So the first one is Psalm 119 verses 9 through 11. It says, how can a young person stay on the path of purity? I don't care how old you are. You're young in the eyes of God because he's eternal. You know what I mean? Like, okay, how can a young person stay on the path of purity? By living according to your word. I seek you with all my heart. Do not let me stray from your commands. I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. So that's one scripture. If we would get that in our hearts, it's declaring what I'm going to do. And if we declare what we're going to do, we'll begin to live that way. I seek you with all my heart. Do not let me stray from your commands. I have hidden my word in your heart that I might not sin against you. And so you begin to live that way. You begin to do that. That's something that you believe. And then Psalm 143, 8 through 10, this is a prayer we would offer. Let the morning bring me word of your unfailing love. For I have put my trust in you. Show me the way I should go. For to you, I entrust my life. Rescue me from my enemies, Lord, for I hide myself in you. And those enemies could be fear. They could be anxiety. They could be worry. They could be actual people coming against you. They could be uh, tension between you and your kids because of a difficult situation, tension between you and a coworker, whatever the enemies are, for I hide myself in you. Teach me to do your will, for you are my God. May your good spirit lead me on level ground. And so we get those into our heart. We tell the Lord, we declare what we're going to do, and then we ask for the Lord for that reminder and for that strengthening. And if we would do that as a people, if we would do that as families, then whole family units and generations of people are being shaped 
by the living God and we're using our stories to impact and to make a difference. So I just want to go ahead and pray. If you guys would close your eyes and bow your heads. God, you are our good father. May your good spirit lead us on level ground. Do not let us stray from your commands, but help us to hide your word in our hearts that we may not sin against you. We entrust our lives to you. Show us the way we should go and bring us each morning word of your unfailing love. Thank you for your word to us, your written word of scripture and your word to us that we hear in our hearts and in our minds when we seek you and we listen for your answer. Thank you for your stories, God, and how you engage with us and how you lead us. We are where we are today because of your goodness and your invitation, and we know there is more for us. In our parenting and in our places of influence and leadership, God, we ask for your wisdom and your insight in how to be great storytellers so that the people in our lives may see you and live. And I just want to give an invitation, but I'm going to set up the invitation in a minute. For me, God is my good father and I trust him. And so before I do anything else, I remember that I am his daughter and I remember that Jesus is my Lord. So there's a power and there's an assurance that I have as I go about this life. And so the invitation for you is if you don't have that and you've just been trying to be a really good person in your own strength, but you wanna change that today by making Jesus Lord of your life, and becoming a son or a daughter of the living God, then I wanna give you the opportunity. So you can simply just say yes to Jesus in your heart. That's what I want. And then you can let me know that by lifting your hand up into there. So if that's you, you'd like to become a son or daughter of God, and you'd like to have the assurance that Jesus is on your side. And I'd love to pray that with you today. God is good. Amen. Let's go ahead and just uh, pray with me uh, out loud. We'll, we'll make some some statements to the Lord. Father God, I thank you for your love. I thank you for your kindness. I thank you for your goodness. You are a good father to me. You are a good parent to me. You comfort me and you protect me. Would you teach me how to do the same for the people in my life? that they would see your love and you would get the glory and honor. In Jesus' name, amen.